Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome everybody to today's seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dan Conway from Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, Dan is currently an associate professor of biomedical engineering at VCU. And uh, by way of background, he did his undergraduate work in bioengineering at Rice University in Houston. He, I, he and I talked a little bit about Rice, what a great, great place that is. And then he went on from there to do his PhD in biomedical engineering at Georgia Tech in Emory, uh, working with Larry McIntyre. And from there, uh, he went to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, for which we forgive him, and worked in the Cardiovascular Research Institute with Martin Schwartz. And while there as a postdoc, uh, he competed for a successfully in American Heart Association postdoctoral award that supported him uh, during that time. And then he joined the faculty at VCU as an assistant professor and now an associate professor. Um, along the way, um, he's been recognized for his work in early career in, in many ways. Uh, he received the Biomedical Engineering Society Award for Cellular and Molecular Bioengineering Rising Star status, which uh, sounds really good to me, so congratulations on that. Uh, he also won a National Science Foundation Career Award that he currently holds. And meanwhile, has been very successful in obtaining funding, including uh, serving as a PI currently on an NIH R35 grant, as well as an R03. Uh, and I mentioned his American Heart uh, Award, uh, American Heart Scientist Development Grant that he's gotten, as well as the NSF Career Award. And he also serves as co-investigator on several other grants with his colleagues <laughs> at VCU. Um, he also holds a couple of patents, so he's been entrepreneurial uh, and translational in his work along the way, uh, relating to uh, cell stretching and FRET for measuring spectral bleed through. Um, the work he's done uh, is focused primarily in understanding the interface of uh, mechanical forces uh, in cells, endothelial cells in particular, uh, and the underlying cell biology, and how those relate to an understanding of basic cell processes from motility and signals that go into the nucleus and so forth, to understanding changes in those factors in pathology, uh, such as in progeria. Um, so he's looked, for example, at expression of members of the cytochrome P50 protein family, uh, <clears throat> and looked at how those are affected in human endothelial cells by uh, shear stress and uh, has shown that actual expression of those genes uh, can be upregulated and that relates uh, directly to arthrogenic uh, endothelial cell phenotypes. Um, he's gone on to show that shear stress and its role in inflammation in endothelial cells um, and the expression of a variety of things including zinc levels in the cell and in particular with respect to cardiovascular sciences, has looked at uh, their role in atherosclerosis um, and flow-dependent mechanotransduction. Uh, more recently, he's done some, I think, really elegant work on understanding signals moving, as I mentioned before, from the cytoskeleton to the nucleus through the link complex that links uh, the nucleus uh, and the uh, cytoskeleton of the cell and determining how forces are transmitted uh, to that part of the cell. And it has shown, I think it was the first report, uh, the Nesprin 2G and the link complex are subject to mechanical force, forces, and also looked at that in fibroblasts from patients uh, with progeria, as I mentioned earlier. So his work has a, <clears throat> a very fundamental, basic molecular biophysical approach to understanding processes, and also a very translational approach that can apply to many things, including the cardiovascular system. So without further ado, great to have you here, Dan. Welcome. Thank you again, Mike, for the, the great introduction, and, and thank, to, thank you to all of you who I've met earlier today or I'll meet later on. Um, it's been really fun to learn more about what's going on at, at the Institute here. Um, what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about things I do in my lab and really how mechanical forces relate to cellular homeostasis. So kind of just an overview of today's talk, I really want to give you a little bit of background in mechanobiology, um, just in case it's a, a broad audience, right, sort of exactly what I mean by that and really give you an overview of what my lab's work has done over the last seven years at VCU with regards to our approaches to measuring mechanical forces across proteins using fret force biosensors. And I'll talk about the role of those forces in cell cell adhesions as well as the nucleus. And I'm going to finish up today, the latter half of my talk, really telling you sort of a case study looking at mechanical forces in epithelial acini um, and how these tools can be really used to better understand the underlying biology in complex cellular systems. So I'm going to just start with this slide and hopefully everyone sort of agrees that all cells are mechanically sensitive. So if we uh, apply externally applied forces to cells, things like shear stress, cyclic stretch, pressure, cells will have this sort of intrinsic ability to sense those forces and respond using traditional cell signaling pathways. And a number of these processes are important in development, 
homeostasis and disease. And the cardiovascular system, you can see, is in all three of these and is perhaps one of the more often studied systems for mechanical forces. But before we go a lot further, I really want to sort of, again, convince you that we don't have to hit the cells with large forces. Cells themselves exert very large forces on their mechanical environment. And it can occur through things like actomyosin contractility. It can occur through changes in ECM stiffness. And it can occur through changes in pressure. And I'll talk about that in the latter part of the, when I get, tell you the story about epithelial asini. And so this is a really old picture. Um, sometimes I like to go back and look at old papers and, and imagine how much easier science was back then. Perhaps that's not true. Perhaps the techniques weren't around back then. Um, but this is, I think, really the first sort of evidence of cells exerting mechanical forces on uh, a surface. And all they did was grow a fibroblast on silicone. And you can see that the cell wrinkles the silicone. And the reason I bring this up is that oftentimes we apply things like shear stretch or cyclic stretch. And we don't take into account the magnitude of the actual forces the cells themselves are exerting on the surface. And oftentimes, for example, the magnitude of forces on focal adhesions, cells exerting on ECM, it can be one to two orders of magnitude higher than the mechanical force of shear stress. So oftentimes we think about sort of these forces as sort of a hurricane force wind on cells. And the reality is it could be more of like a gentle breeze that the cell is sensing and actively responding to, right? And that's part of the importance, I think, of actually making accurate measurements of the cells and the forces is because oftentimes the responses are, not, are active and not passive. And so you can't use sort of your traditional sort of engineering approaches to understand the system if you don't take into account these active responses. So this isn't my work, but I, I, th I like these two studies because I think it really sort of surmises sort of the field of mechanobiology and how ECM and cellular forces can really augment really fundamental biological processes. So the first one on the left here, which you can see is that, um, if I use the brighter pointer, you can see that these cells are stem cells, and they're differentiating based on the ECM stiffness. So on a very soft surface, the cells have the ability to differentiate. These are mesenchymal stem cells, differentiate into neural cells. On a medium stiffness, um, muscle cells, and a harder stiffness, osteoblasts, right? They get exactly the same growth factors, right? It's just the underlying mechanical forces on the cells that are affecting their function. This is another study on the, on the right from Celeste Nelson's group where she took epithelial cells, micro-patterned them into shapes, and then exposed the cells to TGF-beta, which would normally induce epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And hopefully what you can appreciate here by either the image or the heat map analysis of this, that the cells at the edge preferentially undergo this transition. And then she did something, I think, quite clever, where she looked at the sigmoidal pattern. And you can really start to appreciate fundamental differences on the concave versus convex side. And you could postulate that mechanical forces themselves could be really augmenting fundamental responses to things like growth factors. So how does this work? So there's a lot of complicated models for biology. Uh, I like to just start with sort of the simple model that Donald Ingber came out with. It's called cellular tensegrity. And I think it really sort of, what he did is, I think his background is, was like in, you know, is, is a biologist, but he took some art history classes and he looked at this sort of tensegrity concept, right, that's present in architecture, right, where things are in compression and tension and the balance of those forces adopts an equilibrium. And then he applied it to the cell where he showed, and, and sort of other people have shown very elegantly since then, that actin is subject to tensile forces and microtubules resist compression. Right. And so what does this mean? It means two things. One thing is that the cell has the ability to transmit forces long distances. So if we poke or prod the cell in one place, so if anyone has young children, you may have played with this squish toy. You poke it in one place, it causes rapid and, and distant changes in things very far away. Right? Um, the other thing is because the cell is under tensile forces, what happens is the behaviors are very fundamentally different than, for example, the table or the chair you're sitting on, which are primarily compressive forces. Right? So we need to take into account these tensile forces in the cell. So if we look at this sort of cartoon version of the cell and we apply a force to the surface of the cell, whether it be pressure or cyclic stretch, what can happen is that force can be transmitted across the cytoskeleton to distant structures. And this is really what my lab has centered around, sort of these three fundamental structures, focal adhesions on the bottom, cell cell junctions on the side, and the nuclear link complex where the cytoskeleton is integrated into the nuclear envelope. Um, and so these are arguably sort of the points of the, in the cell where you might have the most strain because these are fixed structures, right? And so these stresses that reach there are going to create large forces. 
And basically, what the interesting thing about this, right, is when you blow these structures up molecularly, there's a lot of proteins there. So it can be a very frustrating thing, right? We know there's force there, but which proteins there are changing, which proteins are under load, and which proteins might just simply be there for signaling purposes and not be mechanically responsive. And so really what my lab is trying to do is really unravel on a protein level what are the forces in each of these places, primarily cell-cell contacts and also the nucleus. So how does this work? We leverage a technique called FRET. I don't know if people are familiar with FRET. Um, it's frequently used in biology to measure distance. Okay? If you're not familiar with FRET, maybe you're familiar with fluorescence. So if you have a fluorescent molecule and you excite it with a certain wavelength, what happens is the energy that's emitted, which you actually see, in this case blue light, it's a slightly higher wavelength okay, due to energy loss. And so what can happen is if these two molecules become very close together on the order of less than 5 or 10 nanometers, so the closer they are, the more frequently this happens, the energy that would normally be emitted as blue light will be emitted as yellow light. So classically, people had used this to see if protein A, protein B are together or apart, right? You can get FRET based on the proximity of the proteins, right? And so my postdoctoral fellowship, when I worked with Martin Schwartz, the lab was really bent on trying to use this and leverage this technique of a distance-based measurement and apply it and use it for a force-based measurement, okay? So if you're an engineer, you may have already thought of this, right? Um, but I'll put it up. If you haven't thought about it, the most obvious way is a spring, right? And it's a very simple idea, right? And the two postdocs before me spent a very long time, and I, I, I sort of heard stories of, of many postdocs before that spent many years on this too. Um, a spring is a simple idea, but you need the right spring constant, right? And uh, my former mentor would tell you that he went to nature and he found something, which is spider silk protein or flagelli form, right? But the reality is in nature, there's a lot of things that are elastic. They just didn't have the right spring constants. And so I think the two postdocs before me went through maybe about 10 to 15 different iterations of different elastic peptides to link these things together before they found something that truly was elastic on the correct force regimes. Um, so this is a simple idea here, right, that we put the spring here. If there's little to no force, the two fluorescent proteins are brought in close proximity. And as forces increase, the distance between the two fluor force increases and the fret is reduced. So just keep in mind when I show you data that it's an inverse relationship. So as the fret goes down, the force is going up. And so they did a lot of sort of fundamental um, validation of this using optical tweezers to actually show that as force is applied, the fret is reduced, right? And it sort of operates on a regime of about one to five piconewtons. And other groups have since gone back and changed this spring to things that have a different constant. And they can actually shift this curve out to about 10 piconewtons, depending on what that particular peptide is. So one thing my group has really tried to do is leverage this technology to develop additional FRET sensors. Um, so I'll just use V-Cut here as an example. This is what I did in my postdoc. Um, one of the challenges of this is we're essentially inserting, inserting two GFP molecules in the middle of a protein. Right? Normally, if you think about GFP tagged proteins, you usually put it at the C or the N terminus, right? You don't want to disrupt things, right? In this case, we're putting a strain gauge and we want to put it in the middle of the protein, right? So what do you do, right? So oftentimes we make many different versions of this and we're trying to develop approaches where we can confirm the fret force relationship. So the idea that the fret changes are based on changes in mechanical tension but we also want to be cognizant that we've impacted the structure of the protein, and so we want to validate the biological function of this protein, right? So this sort of Frankenstein-like or chimeric-like protein that we've made, we want to make sure that it works as best as the normal protein in the cell. And so oftentimes we simply just look at the localization, we do FRAP experiments and other sort of functional assays, right, to confirm that this sensor, which is expressed here, looks similar to the biological protein, okay? Uh, and so what my group has done and other groups have done is we've all developed existing sensors for focal adhesions, cell-cell junctions, and nuclear structures. And if you remember back to the slide, I showed you there's many proteins here, and we're beginning to unravel what's going on in a mechanical sense with all of these proteins. So I think my postdoctoral work really highlights really the importance of sort of a direct force measurement approach. So I mentioned earlier, right, that the mechanical forces of shear stress were about one to two orders of magnitude smaller than the actual mechanical forces cells exert on their matrix. We hadn't really done those sort of back of the envelope calculations when we started this project. So we had a hypothesis that cells are not under force, will apply shear stress, and the forces must go up, right? And we were sort of faced with the initial first result that we got was that V-cadherin forces decrease 
at the onset of shear stress, right? Which doesn't make sense, right? So if I blast hurricane force wind on you, you should experience force everywhere, right? And the reality is that this is a very small change in the mechanical state of the cell, right? Then the cell is sort of actively adapting to, okay? Uh, we since followed that up with a number of sort of other approaches to me measure mechanical forces um, using traction force, and that this decrease in V-cadherin force is about 25% also occurs at focal adhesions and also the overall force between the cells. Um, so there seems to be a general relaxation of the cell when you apply force. It's a little bit counterintuitive, okay? But the other interesting thing, and I think it really highlights the importance of making protein-specific measurements, is that the mechanical force on PCAM actually went up with shear stress. And so PCAM is one of these molecules between endothelial cells that has been hypothesized to be a mechanosensor. And this data really further supports that idea that when you apply mechanical force to endothelial cells, the force on this protein is going up. And interestingly, it seemed to be dependent on the intermediate filament protein by Minton. Uh, I was able to follow this up with another paper where we actually went back and tried to understand how does V cadherin relax. It actually depends on a phosphor specific phosphorylation site on V cadherin, and we were able to map this out to um, changes in the proteins that are associated with the adherence junction that help mediate the contractility of the cell. Why is this important? Well, we were able to make a, a mutant mouse which had the inability of V cadherin to be phosphorylated on this site, and this led to changes in the inflammation state in the vasculature in these animals. So the idea is that mechanosensation of flow is a really fundamental goal or property of endothelial cells, and this can really influence the fundamental vascular biology of these cells and the physiology of the arteries, okay? But the main takeaway of this really is that these force changes by the cell are active and not passive. So now what I'd like to do is kind of move into a little bit of the work I've been doing at VCU uh, and first tell you a little bit about our efforts to deconstruct the forces across different regions of cell-cell contact. So primarily my group has been working with epithelial cells, but we've also done a fair bit of work with endothelial cells too. Um, and just to kind of orient you, this is an EM picture of a cell-cell contact in epithelial cells. You can see tight junctions here, which are really fundamentally important in the barrier function. Okay, so tight junctions, I, I sort of give this analogy when I teach undergrads, adherence junctions are like the zipper teeth in your jacket, right? But on a really windy day, you want that flap that goes in front of the zipper, right? Because the wind is going to move through. And so tight junctions are really that sort of flap, right? That sort of metaphoric flap that seal the membrane and prevent water and ions from moving through. And the adherence junction is thought to be classically that mechanical connectivity between the cells. Um, desmosomes are this really interesting structure that I became on sort of this quest to sort of try to understand. Um, they're thought to be classically connected to the intermediate filament cytoskeleton and not the actin cytoskeleton. And they're really important in epithelial, um, basically cell connectivity. The most kind of common example of that is if you had bad desmosomes, your skin would blister. They're also really, really important in cardiac tissues. If you have bad desmosomes, it leads to cardiac arrhythmias. And I'll show you a little bit um, of data we've been working on in that area. So, We've done a lot of sort of fundamental work looking at adherence junctions, right, and how cells sense and respond to forces. One of our studies, just to kind of highlight, again, this idea of sort of observing cells in their natural state and not perturbing them mechanically, we looked at the mechanical forces in cells in a colony at the edge, the center, and then we compared that back to the mechanical forces across E. adherin in a confluent dish. And what we found is that the force scaled based on where you were. So at the edge of the cell, where the cells are proliferating the most, at the edge of the colony, the forces are the highest. But even in a, in a large colony that's on the order of a centimeter wide, the cells in the center still had higher mechanical force, and that was necessary for the cells in the center to be proliferative. So there's this idea that the, that the mechanical state of the cell can really drive sort of fundamental homeostatic processes. We've also begun some very preliminary work to look at tight junctions, which I mentioned were the, the key element in the cell-cell contact for maintaining barrier. And one of the sort of key molecules in this is ZO1. Uh, ZO1 is the molecule that links the cytoskeleton into sort of the three different transmembrane proteins that comprise the tight junctions, claudins, jams, and also occludin. And so we thought this might be a really interesting protein to target for our force measurement technique because it could essentially give us sort of the mechanical state of force across the tight junction. And so we've done a number of sort of preliminary um, force sensors for ZO1, 
and we feel like we have one that's working really well, uh, what we do is we look at um, epithelial cells on the microscope. We look at exactly the same cell basically before, during, and after biaxial stretch. Okay? And so this is a really good way where we can validate that fret force uh, relationship that I was talking about. And what you can see is that when we apply stretch to cells, we see a corresponding drop in the fret efficiency. So that spring is being pulled apart. Right? So we think now that we have, a, a, we're really excited because we have a force sensor for tight junctions and, and sort of pursuing studies in that area. Uh, the last component of the cell-cell contact I'll talk about is the desmosome. Uh, and we got a recent paper out on this where we were actually able to show that mechanical forces are present on desmosomes. And this, I, I want to give a lot of credit to Andrew Kowalczyk, who's at Emory. He studies desmosomes in epithelial cells, particularly in the skin. And when I first started my faculty position, uh, my, my family's down in Atlanta, and I, I just, I'm kind of a science geek, right? Whenever I travel, I want to go and, like, I look on the, the, you know, website and I see who's there, right? Who can I meet while I'm on vacation, right, in whatever location I'm in. So I, I emailed Andrew. Andrew's a really nice guy. And we sat around and I chatted and I said, you know, I'm really fascinated by intermediate filaments. And are they under compression or are they under tension, right? So I mentioned in my tensegrity model, right, actin's under tension, microtubules are under compression. And he said, obviously, they're under tension. And, and we talked about these pictures here where people have stained keratin in epithelial cells. And you can see it's taut. This is where the cell-cell contact is. So it's taut there. He said, it's obvious, right? And I said, well, show me the paper because I want to show people. And he said, there's no paper. You write the paper. And it was like where the light bulb went off, right, on sort of my, my faculty career, right? Is that you have the idea, right? You know it's true, right? And then it's your job to design the experiments to show that your hypothesis is correct, right? Um, so relevant to this uh, audience in terms of the cardiovascular system, um, we became very interested in the mechanical forces of desmosomes in cardiomyocytes. So we bought the induced pluripotent cardiomyocytes so they don't look as pretty as sort of the ones that you would, adult cardiomyocytes you would get from an animal. But one of the really interesting things that we saw is we saw really large changes in fret when the cardiomyocyte was contracted. We didn't have the imaging equipment to acquire fast enough, so we arrested the cells in either a tonic or a relaxed state uh, by either manipulating the, the ion concentrations to arrest them in that tonic state or by inhibiting myosin to uh, arrest them in the, in the um, relaxed state. So we thought this is pretty cool, right, that as the cardiomyocyte beats, there is mechanical force on the desmosome, right? And so you'd say, well, but does that really matter? Right, it's kind of obvious, right? When you pull on something, the forces are going to be higher uh, between the cells. Um, and so I, I've spent a lot of time reading the literature, and, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet Steve Poltzing um, in a variety of different conferences. And I'll just tell you, like, kind of the aside about Steve. Um, I was at a meeting one time at a restaurant, right? And I didn't really want to talk to anyone. I was sitting at the bar, and Steve kept talking to me because, you know, he's a real friendly guy. And I said, um, I'm like, I don't know why this guy keeps talking to me. And he said, What's your research? And I said, I'll shut, him, I'll shut him up, right? Uh, and I said, desmosomes. And, and he, he lit up, and he was like even more excited, right? Um, so, <laughs> so some of this idea came from Steve, and, and I, was, I was really lucky to, to, to say that word desmosomes, right, when I, the first time I met with him. But for those of you who don't know, if you have bad desmosomes, you're at risk of this disease called arrhythmic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And there's a couple different sort of naming conventions for this. Um, it's a fairly frequent disease, um, and it's oftentimes the most common cause of cardiac death in young patients. And typically, this is present in patients who are sort of the super athletic people, right? So if, if you exercise a lot, right, um, you're more at risk of having a sudden uh, arrhythmia event. And post-mortem, when you look at the tissue of these patients, you'll see a lot of scar tissue and fat, right? So it sort of left us to the question of, well, how do you go from a desmosome to an arrhythmic disease? And so what I'm going to show you is some videos of uh, these induced pluripotent cardiomyocytes where we're imaging calcium in these videos. So these are normal uh, cardiomyocytes, and these are cardiomyocytes where we've expressed a dominant negative desmoplakin such that the desmosomes are no longer connected to the intermediate filaments. So one thing about the one here on the right, the dis desmosome disrupted case, you can actually see they beat about twice as fast, right? And the other thing is if you kind of pay attention, there's a lot of sort of like little what I want to call calcium sparks, but I'm, I'm sort of nervous to call, right, because I'm not an expert in cardiomyocytes. But there's some sort of fundamental sort of inappropriate releases of calcium internally in these cells. And so we thought this is pretty cool, right, that we can go from sort of this fundamental mechanobiology thing, perturb the structure that we're saying is important mechanically, right, and somehow alter sort of the fundamental electrophysiology of these cells. 
So a couple other projects I'd like to tell you about before I get into the epithelial asini study. Um, one is really this idea that mechanical forces on the outside of the cell could be propagated all the way to the nucleus. Okay? So this is an idea that other people have put forth um, as well. And we thought that perhaps we could leverage these fret-based force biosensors to actually make these measurements and test these ideas. Um, so in this case, this, this review article, you can see that mechanical forces across the integrins could be transmitted through the actin cytoskeleton onto this complex that's known as the nuclear link complex that consists of nesbrin, um, sun proteins, and the nuclear lamina. So it's really the bridge between the cytosolic cytoskeleton and the nucleoskeleton. So one of the first papers that we were able to get out as an independent group is BCU um, related to um, measuring mechanical forces across this protein nesbrin. And we specifically picked a nesbrin isoform that measures actomyosin generated forces on the nucleus. So we were able to show that there is pres in, in resting cells, there's large forces on the nucleus, and these forces scale based um, on the sort of general contractility of the cytoskeleton. And we've done a number of sort, of sort of fundamental kind of experiments where we stretch cells, we sort of measure the deformation of the nucleus. So again, think about when you're stretching cells, you're actually applying the force not on the nucleus directly, but underneath the cell. So we're really testing this idea that forces on the outside of the cell propagate to the nucleus and how those affect the mechanical forces um, on the nucleus. So you may say that's a little bit esoteric, right? So you're measuring force on the nucleus, but is that really important, right? And so I struggle with this question also myself, is, is well, what's the, what's the functional role of these forces? And so there's a lot of ideas. So people have ideas about DNA unwinding, and there's been some clever experiments people have shown that. But we've really latched onto one idea, which is that mechanical forces could really influence the mechanical state of the nuclear pore complex. And what's the consequence of that? Well, if you apply mechanical force to the nuclear pore complex, you could conceive that it would open more. It might be more permissive for things to move in and out of the nucleus, right? So mRNA to leave, right? But also transcription factors to come in and access the DNA, right? It's an idea people have had for a long time. It's not my idea. Um, and then we noticed in the literature a recent observation by another group. So this is not my data. Um, but we really thought this is a really cool idea, right? So they, they, back to the stem cell story where you put stem cells on sort of the soft and stiff surfaces and they do something different, this group followed that idea. But they took a normal cell and put it on a soft or stiff substrate. And then they did EM to look at the diameter of the nuclear pore. And what they found was about a 20% increase in the size of the nuclear pore when you put it on the stiff surface, right? By nothing else, right? Um, so whether or not this is a direct force propagation, you don't really know, right? It could be a remodeling or an active response by the cell. But they went on to show a number of things related to this transcription factor called YAP, which is really thought to be important in cell growth. Um, basically, the idea is on the stiffer surface, the pore is more open and YAP is more easily accessible um, through the pore to, the, to get into the side of the nucleus. So this is where the light bulb kind of went off. And I had another collaborator, Gant Luxton, who really sort of held our hand on developing this force sensor. So I want to give him a lot of credit. Um, and so we said, can we find a way to use this system to measure mechanical forces on the nuclear pore complex? The nuclear pore complex is very complex. There's a lot of proteins there, um, and it's a very sort of complicated structure. We decided to focus our efforts on proteins that are really important for integrating the pore complex through the membrane into the lumen of the nuclear envelope. And so the one protein that we've so far successfully made is this protein called GP210, or NUP210, that's really thought to be integral in the anchorage of the nucleus. And so we made a, a, a force sensor for this, and we, again, did our same experiment where we have the same cell, so these are paired observations, where it's not stretched, and then we subject it to stretch. And you can see that mechanical stretch of the cell causes the force to go up on this structure. And so you may say, so what? Right, so what, can we relate this back to um, diffusivity? Um, and so my postdoc who's been working on this project found a system in the literature. It's a photoactivatable protein, so it's a fluorescent protein that has a nuclear export signal right, when it's photoactivated. And when it's not photoactivated, it's rapidly imported back into the nucleus. So this provides us a way where we can use light to cause the protein to go out of the nucleus. It will then reset, and then it will come back in the nucleus, and we can measure the import speed. And so this is Kevin's data where he looked at stretched versus unstretched cells, and which you can hopefully appreciate in the green line are cells that are under stretch, and that the re-import of this sensor is faster when the cell is under stretch. 
right? So we're really excited by this idea, and we really kind of, I think this is one direction that my group really wants to go, is really trying to understand the relationship between force and diffusivity through the nuclear pore complex. The other thing I'll just sort of point out that we've begun just doing some basic experiments where we actually stain the pore complex, and we begin to ask questions about, are there changes in the pore complex based on the state of the cell? So you can envision that the pores, right, might be mechanically regulated and how open they are, but also the position of the pore might be really important. So for example, if the, pore, if the nucleus sits on the bottom of the cell, any pores underneath there that are wedged up against the cell membrane effectively would be inactive, right, because they, there's just no room for things to diffuse in and out. Um, and so we've been looking at epithelial cells that are subconfluent, so this is day one of culture, and cells that are super, super confluent. So imagine seven days of culture. The cells are very, very highly confluent, and at this state, the cells are no longer proliferating. And hopefully what you can kind of appreciate is that in the hyper-confluent state, the nucleus is really wedged up against the plasma membrane on the sides. So you can sort of envision that these pores will have less room for diffusion and probably are, are, are less likely to be able to transport things. The other really fascinating thing is that these nuclei develop really large folds. And hopefully what you can appreciate here is in green is the nuclear pores. You can see that those pores are enriched in the fold. So the positioning of the nuclear pore could also have a dramatic impact in the um, sort of the diffusivity through the pore, which could really sort of be a fundamental mechanism by which how cells go from quiescent to in a growth uh, active state. Um, these are MDCK cells, so these are epithelial cells. And so the last thing I just want to highlight before I get into sort of this, the main project I wanted to talk about today is some work we're doing with Amander Nain, who's in mechanical engineering at Virginia Tech. He has a really nice system with um, different kind of fibers that he can make that mimic three-dimensional sort of fibrous ECM, so for example, collagen. Um, and he has a number of really interesting observations that cells preferentially like to move under one condition, but a not another condition. And so he approached me and he said, you know, can, can you, you leverage your fret-based techniques to help me understand what are the fundamental mechanical differences when you have cells on fibers of different diameters, different curvatures? In this case, this sort of pilot experiment that we did is based on fiber spacing. And so what you can actually see here is that there's higher forces when the fibers are more close together. It kind of makes sense because when the fibers are more close together, the cells can spread out more. When the fibers are apart, the cells kind of stuck on one fiber. But we think it's a nice sort of illustration of sort of the power of this technique and really how this technique can be used in more physiological uh, situations, which may include three-dimensional situations. And so that's probably a good segue where I want to sort of take you into sort of this project this is really the thesis of, of a really talented grad student, Vani uh, Narayan, who has worked in my group now for, uh, I guess, about five years. Um, and she's getting ready to graduate. And really, her project started with this just fundamental question we had, which are, what are the fundamental differences in cellular forces when cells are in 2D versus 3D? Okay? And so epithelial cells are a really nice system to study this, because epithelial cells, um, they line the insides and outsides of our body but they also grow in three-dimensional structures. And so you can take certain epithelial cell lines, you can grow them on type of matrix gel, or you could just grow them on glass. They will make flat 2D monolayers. Or you can take them and grow them inside of matrix gel, and they will form uh, these spherical asini. And I'll show you on the next slide what I mean by that. So basically, these, these are asinites. Maybe you can think about them as soccer balls, so the cells are on the outside. You have this water-filled lumen on the inside. Uh, and what, we're gonna, what I'm going to show you today are really these slices of this structure. So you can see here with the compocal, it's closed at the top, it's closed at the bottom, right? And I'm just showing you this equatorial cross-section, okay? And really what these are designed to do is mimic ductal or tubular structures in the body. And people have shown through a lot of studies that when you grow cells in 3D, they behave totally different than you grow them in 2D. And we were trying to show that maybe perhaps some of the differences relate to the mechanical forces. This is where we were confronted with sort of our, our first result that didn't make sense, right? So I mentioned, right, sort of like the, the V coherence story where we exposed endothelial cells to shear stress and the force went down, right? We assumed that cells in 3D would have less force. Part of that's because we grow them in matrix gel. Matrix gel is a very compliant matrix. And initially, we were comparing cells grown in matrix gel to cells grown on glass. And so intuitively, you would assume cells on glass can contract harder. Cells in matrix gel can't contract that much. There's nothing to resist the tensile forces. The ECM is very, very compliant. Um, 
But that's not what we saw. So we saw the forces in 2D are much higher. So we looked at both at the forces between the cell-cell contacts using the e-coherent force sensor, and we also looked at the forces on the nucleus. We saw exactly the same thing. The forces are higher in 3D. So, so how is that possible? The other thing that Vani did that kind of gave us a clue is that she measured the forces over time. So these structures typically start as a, as a mass of cells, and then they grow and divide, and then they create the lumen as they grow. And what we noticed is that the earlier stages, the forces were much lower. So there's something about the force increasing with time. So how, how, how is this possible? Um, we were really lucky at the time to bump into someone at VCU who studied epithelial biology. And he told us, he reminded us, that a lot of um, epithelial cells secrete chloride apically. And so in these three-dimensional structures, what happens is these chloride transporters are present on the apical surface. They secrete chloride into the lumen, and what that causes is water to rush into the lumen and create an osmotic pressure. So this was the hypothesis people had had. There's a number of review articles where people speculate that the chloride uh, secretion people have measured could be creating osmotic pressure. Uh, the CFTR channel is the channel that's actually mutated in cystic fibrosis patients. So classically, you can think about their lungs being full of sticky mucus because not enough chloride is secreted apically to cause enough water to come in to sort of um, make the mucus less viscous, okay? The great thing about this is there's, there's a number of drugs that activate and inhibit this transporter as well as some of the basal transporters that are responsible for getting the chloride into the cell. So what this did was give us a platform where we could really test this idea that osmotic pressure was really the fundamental difference between 2D and 3D. Um, and so this is what my student did. So she adds Forsklin, which activates this chloride channel. You can see the fret drop. There's an inhibitor of the, uh, the CFTR channel, so you can see the fret go up. And when we inhibit the basal lateral sodium um, potassium pump that's required to set this up, we also get the same effect, okay? Um, that's down here, the O-vein that's down here, okay? So um, we struggled to kind of get this story out, and in one sort of iteration of dealing with reviewers, we had a couple reviewers that argued, you're measuring tension, you're not measuring pressure. So you can't infer, right, that the tension is the same as the pressure. And so I would write back letters that, you know, yes it is, and, and, and yada, yada, yada. So it didn't go anywhere, right? So eventually we got rejected. And I was at a meeting where I ran into Jason Gleghorn, and I gave a talk, and by the time I sat down, I had an email from him and said, have you thought about measuring pressure? And I wrote back and I said, if you're reviewer three, I don't want to talk to you. And he said, no. Uh, he said, I can measure pressure for you. And I said, well, where have you been? Um, so he has this really elegant um, system where he uses a microneedle to insert it into a variety of different organoids, and he can actually measure the pressure. And so he, we were fortunate enough that he was willing to take this on, and these are normal MDCK asini, and he's able to measure about 40 pascals of pressure. So a pretty significant amount of pressure. And this is the relative pressure between the inside of the asinus and the liquid outside of the asinus. Okay, so this is the delta P. And so we were really excited because he did a number of inhibitor experiments. So inhibiting the channel or the basal lateral channel, you can see the pressure drop. So we said the story makes sense. And then I said add the activators that activate CFTR, and the pressure didn't go up. And so this was our second time where we were sort of faced with data that made no sense. And so the obvious explanation for me and my graduate student was they didn't make the drug right. So we were going to send them more drug, and we, they tried again and again and again. And finally, Jason sent me an email one night, and he said, I have the answer, but we'll have to get on Skype, and I'll explain it to you. So if you're an engineer, you might appreciate this. He said, have you heard of Laplace's law? And I said, yes, yes, yes. And he said, but you haven't considered it in this case, right? So the idea is that what we're measuring with the e coherent force sensor is circumferential tension, okay? Circumferential tension can be increased by two ways. One is pressure, the other is expansion, right? So that what is going on here is when we add things that further activate the CFTR channel, the pressure doesn't increase because the lumen rapidly expands. So we think there's some kind of intrinsic set point, we don't really understand how, where above a certain amount, the, the pressures can't um, be sustained, right, and that the lumen itself actually expands, right? But the reality is, right, that that was creating a higher increase in tension. So whoever those reviewers were, right, they're correct, right? Um, tension is not equal to pressure, right? And, and this has been established for a long time. 
Um, the other thing that we've done is we've leveraged this to, to make a lot of sort of interesting observations about how pressure and tension could really regulate this system. So one thing my student Vani noticed is that if she activated the CFTR um, transporter, what happens is the lumen became very, very large and the number of cells rapidly increased, right? So if you left it active for the course of like seven days, you could build these monstrous um, asini. And so what she did is she went back in and, and we thought this could be an example of sort of stretch-induced proliferation. So the idea is the osmotic gradient creates stretch or tension on the cells and that's known to induce cell proliferation. So you can see here's a normal asinus that we haven't stimulated and when we activate the CFTR channel, um, what you can see is we can increase, we see an increase in the number of KS67 positive cells, which is a marker for cells that are actively proliferating. The other interesting thing that Vani did is she looked at how this system responds to um, transitions, um, specifically epithelial to mesenchymal transition. This can be induced by applying TGF beta. And what she noticed is that when you add TGF beta, there, this is well established that there's a lumen infilling. So the cells move in as they become more mesenchymal. But what Vani did is she looked at earlier time points, and what she, you can see here is that the slowly there's an, a decrease in the force on e-cadherin, which we see as an increase in FREP as that spring comes closer together. And so it, Jason was kind enough to make these measurements um, directly for us of pressure, and what you can see here is that when you add TGF beta, the osmotic pressure is reduced. Okay? So that led us to ask the question, what if you prevent that drop in pressure? What if you keep the force high on e-cadherin? Will the cells still proceed through EMT? So this is a normal asinus. This is with TGF beta. So you can see the mesenchymal marker in cadherin is expressed uh, all throughout the structure. If we add forsglin, which activates the CFTR, and then add TGF beta, we see no evidence of EMT. So we've looked at a number of markers. We also see no movement of the cells inward. So this is the idea back to the, the image I showed you at the beginning of the talk that the mechanical state of the cells can really influence the response to growth factors. So lastly, what I want to finish up in this system is really talk about the role of the nucleus in these epithelial asini. And we were measuring forces on the link complex, and I sort of had this idea that, well, what if you don't have a link complex, right? It's like, at least we could do that experiment to show that's how important these forces are. Um, and so, there's, fortunately, there's a dominant negative approaches where you can express a dominant negative peptide that essentially disrupts the connections between actin, intermediate filaments, and microtubules to the nucleus. So you can sort of envision a cell, now the nucleus is just floating around, right? And would that do anything, right? Because if it doesn't do anything, right, then there's no point in measuring these forces. Um, and so Vani um, had this data, and we were fortunate enough to run into Tanmay Lele at the University of Florida, who also had the same data in a different epithelial cell line. And we combined forces together, and we got this paper out this summer in Current Biology uh, as part of a joint effort. And these are Vani's pictures here. So these are asini that we allowed to form, and then we had an inducible system with doxycycline, where we could then express the dominant negative and ask the question, after the asinus has formed, if you lose the link complex, what happens? So this is a control dominant negative that um, doesn't disrupt the link complex. So you can see it doesn't do anything. But when we have the actual dominant negative that disrupts the link complex, what you can see here is that the cells rapidly start to move into the lumen, right, just by losing this structure. And you can see by 48 hours, the lumen is completely occluded, right? So we wondered, what's the cause of filling? It's very, very rapid, right? Does it relate to proliferation? Does it relate to migration? And where Tammy really helped out on this project is he had a number of live cell imaging approaches where he could image the same asinus over time. So here you see a control asinus. You see a number of fluctuations in the lumen sidewall, right, based on the thickness of cells. But they just sort of randomly happen, right? They're thinning, thickening, right? But it seems to oscillate back and forth. In the case of the cells with the induced link complex, what happens is you start to see these thinnings and thickenings, right? And then essentially what happens is then there's just sort of a, a sudden mechanical instability in the structure where over the course of just 30 minutes, you have sort of complete collapse of the lumen, right? So the idea is that if you don't have the link complex, that somehow the cell is mechanically unstable, right? Um, it kind of makes sense if you think about the nucleus. A lot of people have shown that the nucleus is much stiffer than the rest of the cell. So some people have said on the order of like 10 times more stiffer than the rest of the cell. So the nucleus could essentially be sort of the bedrock for the cytoskeleton. And absent that, and you challenge the cell with altered mechanical forces, it may be more difficult for the cell to sort of stay in a homeostatic environment. 
So when we stain for EMT markers, I don't believe we've seen actually mesenchymal markers. So, but it does look like the case where if they undergo this EMT, that you know essentially they would form this sort of occluded structure. So somehow it's forming independent of the cells becoming mesenchymal. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so, so we initially thought, like, I think what you were thinking, whereas you know, normally if you go through EMT, you disrupt apical basal polarity. So in this case, GP135 is an apical marker. And you can see as the cells start to move in early, the apical markers are still maintained. And it's only later after the lumen has filled that you see this inversion of apical basal polarity. So the initial event is not disruption of apical basal polarity. So one thing that Vani noticed um, was that the cells themselves actually divide in the wrong direction. So in the top case, I don't know if people have thought about this concept called asymmetric cell division. This is really important in sort of epithelial homeostasis. So this is the idea if you had a monolayer, you only want the cells to divide in that direction. You never want them to divide out of plane so that the daughter cell is either above or below the, the monolayer. In the case of the asini, what you want the cell to do is normally divide in the wall, in the plane of the wall of the asinus. But what we started to notice is that some of the cells in the middle were dividing inward, and then Vani was able to find a number of examples where that yet hadn't happened. So this is the first event here of, of some kind of cell division, but you can see that division is going to cause this daughter cell to divide or move into the lumen, right, or sort of basally, either way you want to think about it, but it's going to cause one cell to be out of plane. So Vani went back and characterized this, and what she found is in the normal cell, normal asini, um, the, the mitotic spindle is always angled the way you would expect it to be, but in the case of the dominant negative disrupt, link disrupted uh, asini, it's totally random. So on average, about 45 degrees. So you, then you say, is this really the reason? Back to this question about migration versus proliferation. So what Vani did is she went back and inhibited uh, cell division with this drug called afidicolin, and what you can see is that we induced the, the dominant negative, which is labeled here in red. You can see that the cells are starting to move in, whereas if we induce it but block proliferation, right, which is monitored here by EDU, you see absolutely no evidence of the cell moving in. So we think that some of those asymmetric cell divisions are sort of the thing that disrupts uh, the mechanical nature of the, the structure and can ultimately cause it to collapse so fast. Um, I just also like to show you that Vani's also shown this in 2D, right? So these are trans wells, these are epithelial cells. So this is the control case. You can see a cell here dividing. You can see that cell is going to divide in the plane that you would want it to. In this case of the link complex disrupted cells, you can see this, this cell here is dividing out of plane. Okay, so we can recapitulate this also in 2D. Uh, and then the other thing that Vani's noticed, if you grow these cells a long time in culture, expressing the dominant negative cache, um, so this is the control case. We can certainly find a few examples if we hunt and look around um, of some cells that have sort of, you know, kind of a couple cells have kind of come out and sort of stratified. But in the case of the dominant native cache, we found lots of examples where there's these really big balls of cells that have grown on top, right? So there's something about the cells growing up and being able to survive being Anchorage independent. So we think this is pretty cool. Um, and obviously there's a lot of implications for cancer. Um, the other thing that Vani has done, because we have this in this inducible system, she mixes the wild type cells with the inducible cells, allows the structure to form, and then induces it. And we call this like a point defect, right? And this is the reality is this is probably how most cancers arise, right? Not all the cells in that area get the mutation, but a few cells get the mutation, right? And then what happens? And so you can see this asinus where she's done a number of serial confocal sections, so it goes around A to F and comes back around this way. But what you can see is that even though a few cells are expressing the dominant negative peptide, as shown in red, that you still get this movement into the lumen. And in fact, the cells that move into the lumen are only the disrupted cells, right? So you can still create the same event, right, by only disrupting this in a few cells. Okay. So what is my long-term vision, right? I think this is a really interesting platform where we can measure mechanical forces in 3D. And I really want to go in sort of the direction of what are the forces in not just homeostasis, but also morphogenesis. And so while we were sort of, you know, thinking about this paper and looking at pictures of the Laplace law, I came across this picture of a balloon, right, where it sort of reminded me of sort of this budding event 
of epithelial cells. And it also reminded me a lot about angiogenesis, right? So I'm an engineer. I try to sort of simplify the biology down to really fundamental things. You may say tubulogenesis and epithelial cells is nothing like angiogenesis, but it looks like it to me, right, in terms of like the movement and the polarization of cells. And we really wondered what's the relationship between the pressure and also the local stiffness of the cells at the budding site. And so is there a way that we could take our tools where we can disrupt the link complex and we can disrupt other elements of the cell and create heterogeneity in the cellular stiffness and then play around with the pressure and see if we can create a budding event in the absence of growth factors, right? And that's really one direction I'd like to go, whether it's in epithelial cells or endothelial cells, I think that's a really cool thing, thing that we can do to try to understand the mechanics of morphogenesis. So just to wrap up with some final thoughts, um, I hope at least if you take away something today is that um, like anything in science, oftentimes your observations are counterintuitive to your original hypotheses. That's the same thing with mechanical forces, right? So oftentimes what we measure is not what we expected. I hope that sort of promotes sort of the value of sort of tools to directly measure mechanical forces. Um, and I hope in this last story that I spent talking about the epithelial asini, you can really get an idea for how these direct measurements can really help understand the sort of fundamental biology of cellular and tissue structures. Um, the other thing I guess you should take away is that forces are actively generated by cells. And we're pretty excited to be able to show that pressure, osmotic pressure, can be a significant contributor to mechanical forces. Um, and then hopefully just a general idea, right, about forces being necessary for cellular and tissue homeostasis, both at the level of cell-cell communication, right, but also the mechanical stability of the structure, right, as I showed you in the last example with the link complex. Um, I've been really fortunate at VCU to have a big group. A lot of that consists of graduate students and postdocs, but a whole cohort of undergraduate students have worked with me. I don't have a picture of the whole group. It's, it's hard. It's like herding sheep to get everyone together for the same picture. Um, but you can see a bunch of people. Uh, Vani, whose work I really highlighted here in the latter half of the talk. Um, but you can see, um, and this is my daughter right here. So she showed up for one of the pictures as well. Um, and, and also, thank you to all the funding sources and collaborators as well who made this possible. So thank you all so much for your attention. Yes. So yeah, I think if I remember correctly, Vani did do that experiment. It didn't work. So once they've undergone this transition, what we don't know is if it's because the lumen is gone, if the apical versus basal proteins are all mixed up, and for example, now you can't recreate the pressure. We're not really sure. Or perhaps once you undergo the transition, the force doesn't revert it. Right? Maybe there's a different mechanism to revert it. So I think certainly there's examples in development where you get EMT in certain places and other places you don't, right? So, so whether or not, I don't know the relationship between the matrix and the pressure, right? So that's what I don't know, right? Um, I think there's also, and, and we, we commented about this in, in the revision we just sent back about that paper, there's evidences of, of dysregulation of CFTR being associated with cancer also in the literature, right? So I guess the idea would be if your CFTR is not working correctly, then maybe your cells are more likely to undergo cancerous transitions. Yeah. Steve. Can you measure actually the distance between the cell to cell junctions and the homologous behavior? I think to do that, well, I guess you could maybe do that with super resolution. We haven't done that. Um, or like an EM approach. One cell, one cell is a log distance, and therefore it's junction degree, right? Because something that I know is at least for Dr. Sanders. Mm-hmm. 
So I guess we haven't, you're sort of asking the question, does the, the junction angle change based on the? Yeah, so we haven't done a careful, so Vani's gotten quite good at, um, if you're willing to tolerate me going back here, um, quite good at, in, in this case, she's actually imaging the same asinus. So this is the same asinus between here and here. But we haven't done, like you're saying, a careful analysis to see if the cell is stretching out or if division is sort of relieving that strain. We haven't, we haven't done that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's correct. So we've looked in the cancer literature a little bit, and we commented about this in the paper that a number of cancers are associated with loss of proteins associated with the link complex. So there is a little bit of sort of correlative evidence about that. I think in terms of the link biology, um, very little has been done to sort of look at the expression profile, as you say, like during development or in specific tissues. Um, are the nesbrins upregulated, downregulated? People have started to do that, for example, with lamins, right? So lamin A, oftentimes, its expression will vary depending on uh, the development stage or the ECM stiffness. So people are starting to do that. Um, I just don't know what it means, right? So obviously, if you don't have a link complex, that's bad. But what does it mean if you have a little bit of a link complex? Or what does it mean if you have one component of it but not the other? I mean, part of the reason we use the dominant negative approach um, is because there's so there's four different nesbrins and two different sun proteins. And so it's a very complicated idea. We're not really sure if, you know, in, in the mouse model, if you knock out one, one compensates. But we're not really sure if it fully compensates. And so we don't know what it means. For example, we've looked in different tissues, and you have predominantly nesbrin 2. In other tissues, you pro predominantly have nesbrin 1. But we have no idea what that means in a mechanical sense or a biological sense. For sure, and I, I think that's a, uh, I didn't have time to talk about it today, but we have a, a project on this for endothelial cells and how they respond to shear stress, and that the chromatin compaction um, really affects how quickly they align to flow. So we're, we're trying to move in that direction as well. Um, so we're, we're thinking about this. Yeah. If I can just ask a little follow-up to uh, Rob's question. So think about tumor microenvironment and, and, and a tumor kind of you know, nibbling away at the outside of normal tissue. Um, and I know that you, you, you simulate these roads and PTA states uh, to be efficient. But I'm just kind of wondering if the sort of uh, forces you're describing can be used to model anyway and explain um, the differential growth of the outer border of the tumor. And if you can use that as a strategy, potentially, uh, to think about strategically where you want to interfere with the tumor at a certain stage, for example. Sure, right. And I think the other thing, I guess, just to kind of follow up on that, that we've thought about is we just don't know how to do it, but if you could restore the link complex in cancer cells, right, could you slow it down? Could you revert it back? Um, we just haven't, we haven't come up with a clever sort of experimental approach to do that. But we're certainly thinking about this, yeah. Maybe this is known, but um, most of the cancer cells that Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in, in terms of the stretch experiments, it is a slow process, right? Because when you, you know, to take a picture, right, I mean, it's going to take on the order of, of seconds, right? Because we just don't have fast imaging modalities, um, at least in my group. But the stretch problem is, is further magnified. When you stretch the cell, there's 
in, invariably some translocation. So you have to find back the same cell, refocus. And so typically it's several, you know, at least one minute, if not longer, between the initial image and the subsequent image. So people have asked us before about elastic versus viscoelastic, right? And like, is there any creep? And the reality is by the time we take a picture, the second picture when the cell stretched, it's, you know, it, it's in some new equilibrium. So we're not capturing. So no, no. I, yeah, I think it's and it's. I think it's just our ability to. I mean, particularly if you want to do the stretch experiment, right? Like things are going to move. But, but if you're sort of asking the the question in this essence, I mean, no, we're not. We're not able to detect any wiggling of the cell, right? So we're not. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all.